every second and fourth Thursday of the month at noon mountain, we will be here with a new presentation. During this presentation, you may come up with questions. Um, if you do, please use the chat, not the chat, I'm sorry, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to send in your question. And some of you have already figured this out, so that's great. Um, your question will be addressed by Walt at the end. What's up, Walt? I'm looking at 62 participants. All right. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> My God. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to Walt um, Ostromecki. He is an ANA past president and a professional educator for 38 years. Um, Walt is a prolific hobby collector, writer, speaker, and youth family involvement activities educator. He's received numerous top numismatic honors awards, including ANA's highest, the Fair and Zerby in 2020, and Numismatic News Ambassador Award in 1988. Walt will be presenting the story of the U.S. trade dollar, um, 1873 to 1885, and Walt, it's all yours. Well, welcome. Those of you that are out there, I hope I find something entertaining and educational for you. By the way, I'm a collector of trade dollars. I'm not the expert, and a lot of my research came from meeting with Ken Brissett, former editor of the Red Book in Summer Seminar 1982, a long time ago. And we sat down and talked about it, and I developed this story, but I love collecting something that's, that's off the beaten path. So we'll begin here. And with our first slide here, the origin of and the history behind the trade dollar. Now, notice the dates do not match the talk intro. However, this is the time period for the trade dollar, its development, and so forth. So I wanted to begin here with the origins. And before we go, I'm going to go through the screen slowly. Later on, we get to the grading part. I'm going to let you come back to it, but I'll talk about the grading but some interesting notes before we proceed. Number one, did, the, did you know the U.S. trade dollar authorized by the Coinage Act of 1873 ended production of the silver domestic dollar at the time? That was a Liberty coin. Many people were not aware of that. Did you know the law's nickname was, here's a funny one, the crime of 1873? Yes, they liked that old Liberty design. Did you know the Coinage Act of 1965? Title I, Section 102, made the trade dollar once again legal tender status where? In the U.S. as of 1965. Why? Well, here before I quote Ken Brissett, that was due to a mistake in the writing of the law. It was not intended to be legal tender. However, the way the law was written, it became so. And number four here, did you know the law authorizing the trade dollar? was repealed in when? February of 1887. So that's why I add the dates of that. What, what I want to find interesting is if we found the two proof issues, 84 and 85 later on, you'll see an example, but why were there no 86 or 87 proofs issued? That's still a good question. Even Walter Breen, the researcher of the Mint Records, had no answer to that as well. Okay, so let's move on here. I'm going to give you a chance to read most of it here but as i said our story begins in 1869 with secretary of the treasury boutwell called attention to the growth of our government's what here mining and coining interest notice the mint and the government was interested in both at that time he said that he now needed a bureau located in washington headed by an officer in that direction and the idea was trying to discourage the exportation of bullion from the United States to foreign mints. Well, several weeks later, he asked Jay Knox, the deputy comptroller of currency, to prepare a bill which would include the provisions needed to get this statue on the mint records. The bill would be a grand version of the Act of 1837. Okay, at that time, we're talking way back then which had grown obsolete through the passage of years. Dispensing outmoded provisions and so forth were a real problem, especially when it came to coinage denominations in the 1830s and earlier. So on the coinage sides, noted here in the green headlines, are the changes that were made. First off, the Office of Mint Treasurer was abolished. Did you know someone actually was a mint treasurer? 
duties were assigned to a new person called a mint superintendent. Number two, the coinage chain charge of one half of 1% was abolished. Why? In order to encourage depositors of silver and gold to the mints and not ship it elsewhere. The silver dollar, number three, Liberty type weighing 384 grains, which had long ceased to circulate in the country because of its size and, of course, probably other reasons in certain areas, was discontinued. And the Mexican peso, of course, filled in a little bit. Number four, if we talk about the trade dollar, would be established with 420 grains was authorized. Three quarters of a grain fine more than the Mexican peso and bear the value on the reverse of the coin. Minor silver coins were to be replaced with, unif with a uniform series of copper nickel metals because these were being wisely counterfeited, widely melted for the silver value by people here and shipped many cases overseas. The silver half dime would be replaced with, as it says here in number five, a non-silver metal alloy. That's the writing of the mint directive here. And bear the denomination five cent. We know what happened later in 19, 1883 with the five cent issue. See, no gold or silver coinage was addressed after the congressional debate added. But they did add something. The Cong Congress at that time added a one cent coin to be made of bronze along with the weights and possibly they have it in the records as well. One, one cent silver coin was, dis was also discussed. The half dollar was increased from 192 grains and would remain the rest in bronze. So it'd be 192.9. The two cent, three cent half dime coins were to be eliminated. Yet, oddly enough, none of the gold coinage was addressed to be eliminated. Well, after much debate, Congress is good at that, as you probably well know. In 1873, both houses agreed, and the Coinage Act of 1873, now we've moved up a few years, was finally passed on February 12, 1873. However, the adoption of the new trade dollar, weighing 420 grains, would turn out to be contrary to its express purpose. And we'll cover this again in a little more detail. As it, as it included, as it was included with silver subsidy coins, these are coins made for circulation, which gave that particular trade dollar legal status, legal tender status up to $5 in the United States. Okay, so. That was a brief, quick history. You can read it, I'm sure, at your leisure and get a little more out of it. So what was the original intent and use of the trade dollar? Well, number one, of course, there's two. They were not intended to be legal tender in the United States, but unfortunately were, and that would be changed later on. Number two, the extra silver weight was intended to match that of the Mexican silver coins, then favored in China and all through far the Far East. First off, we're going to need a designer for the coin. And of course, the U.S. trade dollar designer was William Barber, the fifth chief engraver of the United States Mint. And he produced a number of designs, and we'll take a look at a few of those in just a bit. Prototypes to be considered for the trade dollar, the 20 cent piece, and numerous other patterns. Barber's son succeeded him, Charles, as the Mint's chief engraver. And below there in the red, you'll note the specifications for the new trade dollar. I'll let you view those for a bit if you haven't, and then we'll move on. But there we go. So here's the design features, and I won't explain, I won't read them here. It'll take a lot of time, but I'll let you look at it here through your leisure, uh, both the obverse and the reverse. I'm sure you can review this program at any time you decide, and that'll help you understand more about the design, but some of the pattern pieces are far more exciting than the actual. Come on. Okay, well now take a look at some of the mint pattern pieces. And these were pattern proposals from 1871 to 1873 before the coin actually is struck. I do not own this particular piece here, but it's Judd 
1121. It's a silver pattern. And I credit it to Heritage Auctions, which sold sold it for a number of years back for $3,745. It's a very simple one. It looks like they're the lady there, Lady Liberty, is a crown over the entire world with that cap and the dollar. The first 1872 silver trade pattern design, and this has been rumored, and this is what I got from Mr. Brissett. The rumors persist that this pattern type was made in China. I don't know. But this is an image from Heritage, which they graciously provided for this program so you could see it. But this is an 1872 trade dollar. They've got the obverse on the left and the reverse on the right. It's a beautiful pattern, very simple design. Takes after the 1871 earlier there of Barber and his designs. Another trade dollar. This is a pattern, 1872. This one is very similar to what we just saw but it's in copper. And there's no recorded number of how many of these patterns were made. I would suspect maybe two, three, or four so they could be passed around for the Secretary of the Treasury, the Mint Superintendents, and others to view perhaps even the President. Well, this is a nice one here. It has a lot of scratches because it's been badly handled over the years. Okay, there's two more. And it's interesting to note, here's two more jet patterns. These are both in silver. Notice the difference in color from the jet pieces. These are 1217 and 1219. And notice what Judd used in his book about the trade dollar. He called them commercial dollars, which is actually the name that should have been in the legislation, which would keep it in the trade dollar and not have it be legal tender status in the United States. Again, it shows the grains, it shows the fineness, and it changes the like the eleven, which be, or the uh, excuse me, the twelve nineteen, which later on became a Lady Liberty possibility. Eighteen seventy three on their trade dollar pattern. This one is silver. This one again has coming down to what we'll see in just a little bit. And it was sold by Heritage in two thousand nine, who provided the photograph for three thousand seven hundred and thirty seven dollars and fifty cents. I like the banner with, over the reverse, especially with the eagle. It looks like it's almost a high relief on the reverse. It's a great strike on that particular pattern piece. 1873, another pattern, the Judd 1311 trade dollar. This is my favorite design. I love the reverse that I mentioned earlier. But take a look at the pattern here on the right. The front is coming down to it. Notice her feet are a lot bigger here. We'll get into feet and some of the design techniques on it too. But she doesn't look like she's smiling. And the other trade dollars that actually were designed and struck, you almost see the Lady Liberty smiling there. But the reverse, look at that eagle holding the arrows and the thing. I just love this particular coin. It's a beauty. Okay, 1873, Philadelphia. First year of pattern trade dollar. This is a proof issue. PCGS registry set, Cameo, proof 66. Another nice coin. Look what it sold for in 2019, $21,000. Wish I had the money to spend on that. I like the eagle too. He's standing there. He's looking up, bold, taking off. Another beautiful piece. Okay, there's also counterfeits, and we'll get to some of those later on. But 1873, this is one of the biggest counterfeits that was discovered with the trade dollars. And you'll notice here, I put some purple arrows so you can view them. Notice the poor design relief. There's pits, die marks all through this coin. You can even see them at different spots here and here. And through here, here, pits, this is just surface. This is not level here. But the indentation at 2 and 10 o'clock on the obverse and reverse is a dead giveaway. We don't know exactly. These were not made of silver. They are made of some kind of alloy, giving it a goldish color more so. 1875 trade dollar. Pattern type. This is number one. There's also pattern types, too, that had different reverses and obverse. Again, this is one of many that I have access to. This is a Judd 1426. 
But notice down at the bottom on the left of it, at the obverse of it, the date of In God We Trust was added below there. Uh, it might have it, it sort of narrowed down the design, but take a look at Liberty. Now that she's holding a flower, she actually seems to be smiling. So they did a great, the designer did a great job in doing this particular one. $15,000 worth. And of course, the 1883, here's just an overview. There were two different types, and we'll get into that into a little bit more detail. But for now, to whet your appetite, to hopefully spark your interest in collecting these as I do, we call types one fingers, we call types two berries. And we'll look at some of these combinations. But Liberty holding out her flowers has four fingers or three fingers. Berries, two, or is there three? So those are some of the major designs that have been in issuance. Oh, I think I went too, I went too far. So here we go. He comes with the first strike. 1873 was the first year of the trade dollar. This is design type number one. Of course, on the left, you will see as the arrow points, and you can probably see I tried to magnify it as best I could, three fingers pointing outwards. The fourth one will come in just a little bit later. You also notice the Liberty band down by her left hand as it goes down. The Liberty, the point at the end, it points to the left at the very bottom. Minor design error. And of course, on the reverse, we have an arrow at the right, which has a tip, which just is away from the tip of the two. And there is no berry beneath the wing there or beneath the claws and the branch. We'll see that added in type two. It's an 1876, that's not a very good coin, but it shows the detail and I had it clean so you can actually see it better. There's a type two, obverse and reverse. And these, this is a grading of an AU coin, approximately about $450. But notice here the hand, you can count the fingers and I tried to blow it up to where you can see all four fingers. And the banner points downwards on the band of liberty. The reverse has the extra berry right below that thing. If you look at the purple eagle, and you'll also notice that the arrow is raw touching, and it really is just a slight, not touching that too, but it's a lot closer than it was in the type one. So those help you identify your two major type Okay, vintage figures. Well, most of this information you can probably get from the Red Book. And I'm just going to go over it quickly here because it does bear consideration in this particular talk. The circulation strikes of U.S. trade dollars were produced at what? Three different U.S. mints. Philadelphia, Carson City, and San Francisco from 1873 to 1878. Proof trade dollars. We'll find out why there were proofs were produced at only at the Philadelphia Mint in small quantities from 1873 to 1885. Now, these quantities, according again to Mr. Brissett, are only estimates. The Mint did not keep any records of the ones that they produced for collectors or for individuals or presentation pieces. So we're only going to have guesstimates. Those are the quantities that are listed in the Red Book. And so, just to ask, well, why the proof trade dollars? Well, retired Red Book editor Ken Brissett commented, probably for collectors. Ah, they were numismatists around at this time, as that none were listed by the Philadelphia Mint Director's Report and believed to be not part of the regular Mint issue. So you cannot say they were put in with it, but there are no true records, so they could be. The 1884-85, the prize trade dollars, were unknown to collectors until 1908. After 1878, all trade dollar specimen proofs, and they're called specimen proofs, kind of interesting in the title. The mintage figures are listed are only estimations, but who knows? And why no 1886 or 1887? 
They certainly could be. And if we didn't find the first two until 1908, there might be something out there for you and I as collectors in the hunt to find those proofs. They just might be out there. But watch out for counterfeits, and we'll get into that later on. But additional note down at the end of the title here, about 44,000 trade dollars were melted on July 19th, 1878. Many of these are thought to have been the 78 cc's, which is extremely difficult to find. The law authorizing them, of course, was repealed. I'll mention again in 1887. So here are some of the mintage figures. And again, I won't spend much time dwelling on this particular part of the program because you can find this stuff. But if you notice the first year, mintage was very small. And of course, the San Francisco mint having access to the silver from the Carson City area as well, uh, did very well. Now you notice in 74, you'll find that mintage totals start going up in the 2 million for San Francisco. The CC, of course, look at that, 1,300. Same thing on the 75, look at the CC. Then they begin to drop off. You see, these are only based on demand that was needed to be used in the Far East and Asia and China. So people started to, well, we've got plenty out there. There was other competition of silver coins out there as well. And notice you'll see now that the Philadelphia strikage will begin to drop off, drop off, drop off. And they'll get down to just a few as we'll see. The year was 1877S. Look at the biggest one year quantity. San Francisco was certainly busy making these particular trade dollars for use. Nine and a half million? Wow. And then later on, we'll get down to here. Now, there's a screen you'll notice in 1879S. It says zero, but two are known. If anybody is interested in one, even though it says all our counterfeits, I would entertain an offer to buy one. I have two that I found over 30 years of searching. So just for the fun. Proof stikes of US trade dollars are listed here. Figures again are estimates. In 1883, there's a concern that this was added into it according to Mr. Brissett, added into the regular total for that year because one of the mint superintendents was very concerned about the, there in Philadelphia, about the proof strikes being out. But 1876, well, that was a centennial year for the United States. And I assume there were a lot more issued for collector demand or having a memento or a souvenir of our centennial. Okay, one of the things that you probably notice on many silver or many trade dollars which you see is why the chop marks and what is a chop mark well let's let's take a look and go through that so what are and why are there chop marks on many u.s trade dollars and i'll read along with you here there are small symbols hand stamped onto how they're raised okay if the coin if it happened to stamp on the front it's raised if you look on the back it almost looks like it's infused or cut into the design that represents the mark of a banker and a declaration that the coin was genuine and contained ne the necessary 420 grains of U.S. silver. My question that I pose for an audience when I ask about people that collect trade dollars, well, did this stamped on mark increase the silver grain content? You know, in talking with Ken Percet about it, he just said, hmm, good thought, Walt, never thought about that. Anyway, there's, is there an answer? I don't know. I don't have one, but that's probably the fun that we have with our hobby. The U.S. trade dollar facilitated trade with China and the Orient, as I mentioned before, and all the proximate weights of the Spanish dollar, which set a standard for it became de facto in the Far East once the U.S. trade dollar got involved. Top mark U.S. trade dollars are fascinating, as we shall see but they are valued less by collectors and shunned in favor of high-grade pristine coinage. Chop mark dollars were not redeemable, period, by the U.S. government. That was a law that was this. So let's, let's digress here and 
maybe you get an ID. You've probably seen a few chop marks. I got a prize one in there. I'll show you at the end by moving on. But note, very, very few Philadelphia mint trade dollars are known to have chance chop marks. Reason? Low mintages of the coin itself. So here, if you're not familiar with it, you can see the examples of it. And I've tried to highlight some areas. On the left, we've got an 1873S trade dollar with multiple raised chalk marks. There's quite a few on there. So you think that would have had more silver grain? I don't know what they stamped it with. But we know that from the stain, we take a look at it, it probably wasn't silver. So maybe there's some rust on the 1873 here on the left, the S. 76S, okay. Again. They were chop marked randomly on both the obverse and reverse in commerce. There's more chop mark examples. I brought in a Carson City, which I don't have in my collection. There's a couple, but there, for some reason, it doesn't have that many stop marks, but this is in a registry set. So it's interesting to see on the right, you've got a 75 CC and AU grade with some nice chop marks, especially on the back. Where were chop marks put? Just randomly wherever the merchant felt like putting it now how about some loaded you hear today you get loaded french fries at mcdonald's or someplace else well this is what these are some of my favorites and my prize coin is there on the left it's an 1878s obverse loaded with chop marks i wonder if this didn't somehow affect the coin you know is is, is a silver grain content still in this case 4.20 Something to think about, but I just happened to like this particular one. It was really done. So it looks like chop marks are put over chop marks or put over chop marks or well used. Very curious as to what, why, but you know, I had to pay a lot to get that. But I said, you're crazy. No, I said, I like it. I want it. It's unique. But an 1878 S is here on the right. Obvious, again, loaded chop marks. You can see the results of the, if you look on the left <clears throat> side of the, coin there, you'll see those. And now seeing the reverse side, you can see some of the chop marks here in the center and around, I hope my pointer's working, that have come through and show on the back. And these look like they're incused, but they're not. So US trade dollars, regular strikes by date, mint marks, and just some more of the basics. For us as collectors, A virtual and visual tour of trade dollars here again is part of our tour today and actually began in 1872. Now, again, we go back to the dates. This is the 1869 to 1887 period that I noted on the slide at the beginning of this particular program. But it begins in 1872, next to the last Liberty Seated Dollar, 1872. Nice one I have in my collection. There's a die crack on the reverse between the one and the D, but that's all right. It also has the same die crack here on the left of the coin, right near the date up into the shield. But it is an MS64 with a minage of 1.1 million. Value today, about $6,500. So beautiful coin, well. Well struck. You can see the drapery and look at the eagle's feathers on the reverse. Just bold, one of the earlier strikes, detailed, rich. So here's the last of the Liberty Seated, which I don't own these, but these are from the Philadelphia Mint, issued, what, 293,000 roughly, Carson City, 2,300. And look at this, San Francisco struck, according to Mint records from the superintendent's ledger, 700, but not one has been known in any collection. The Eliasburg collection did not have one either, which is, if he didn't have it, I doubt anybody else will. But it's something we could continue to look for today. But beware of counterfeits, and we'll take a look at the counterfeits just a little bit later in this program. So we get a chance to see here on the left, the first year issue. Nice particular, I wish I owned this one, but I don't. MS-63, look at the beautiful coloring, starting to tone lightly especially on the reverse, the golden colors are coming in. And here, the last the last year issue of that 
from the Carson City Mint. Well, not quite as detailed. This is an XF piece. I, they're tough to find in that particular issue. But they did circulate. They were used and probably here in commerce in the United States. So the first year of the trade dollar being issued. And again, here we take a look at the total 396,006. And these are strikes produced at Philadelphia. Regular strike here on the right, which is a type one design. Nice heavy detail. Unfortunately, this one has been clean at one time, but people like to make them shiny. I guess that's the way they tried to sell them. But look at the proof here on the right side, Philadelphia proof strike. This is a type one. Oh, look at the blues and the blues and the purples, the reds, the oranges. It really makes it really looks like the eagle is on a background with a with a setting sunset, is the way I look at this particular coin. Beautiful to see. Oops. 1873, first year strikes from the Carson City and San Francisco mints. You notice the CC mintage here on the left, small amount, but all the silver for these came from the Comstock load. You're counting the fingers on Miss Liberty? Got three. <laughs> but look at the detail. The coin, this coin is not graded. I wish it was, but someone loaned me the piece to, to use for this program. They didn't grade it. When there's a little wear, because you'll see the wear on her elbow here of Liberty seated, where the hand and where the sheaves are behind it. That's one of the highest points that sees the first, any kind of really wear on it. We'll get to that a little bit later when we get to grading. But that is, but the detail is still sharp. And on again, here's an S vintage one. Now notice the difference in the eagles, even though the coin is blown up a little bit. I tried to blow it up and it looks like the coin is lopsided, but it is not. But I wanted to show the detail. It almost looks like a different die or a master die as from the Carson City one. So Carson City may have got one. They may have used different dies that they had that were made up and sent by Philadelphia. That was before they were buried in the backyard there of the Carson City Mint. But the San Francisco one is just interesting. How it has a big S. Like many other coins, like cents and other coins from San Francisco, we have S's of all different sizes that were used on these because they were punched in. And who knows how long the dies lasted. 1874, the second year of issue, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to see them a little bit later on. But the second year of strikes, Philadelphia, Carson City, and San Francisco. And the Philadelphia Mintage, again, 987,000. Another beautiful, but again, the Carson City had the, one of the largest mintages of 13,300. Nice, but I still love those Carson City. Somehow they just look different. 1874 is San Francisco, which has a mintage of 2.5. This is a grade very fine. And I use this because I one of the few grades of a uh, trade dollar that I have in very fine condition. This is the high end part of very fine in your grading, the Sheldon grading scale, 30 to 35. <coughs> but it's detail is still sharp. And you can notice that her, the Liberty's arms, especially the Left one, that's where your wear is going to start on her toes, on her knee cap. So those are the high points. And again, as we go through briefly the grading in just a little bit. Come on, there we go. 1878, this is the last year of the regular issues. Okay, notice here is what's Philadelphia mint total? It's zero. Philadelphia had long since, but they were preparing dyes or were they? See, that's a concern. If you look at some of the dies that you'll see on the coins from San Francisco and Carson City especially, they could have been put together and mule from various dies. There's no way to identify them. I wish we had time to get enough to go through, but searching through them today would be almost impossible. But 97,000 are believed 
maybe the largest quantity. This one particularly grades here, extra fine 40. A very lot of wear, but it's still very bold. Notice the detail on the arms here is much taller. The feet are very legible, so it could grade higher, but my grade put on this one is extra fine 40 because of the reverse. Now, it almost looks like there's a die crack right through the center of Liberty's breast. Could be, but it's just probably a lot of dirt. When a coin like that's out in a circulation, I do not like to dip them even in water to clean them. I like them to leave them as I found them. But notice the bold CC, one of the bolder ones. That's what I like about this 78 one. Most of the ones, eh, they're very light. They're various difference. There's also CCs that move around up and down a little bit. So they separate them left to right, up and down. So those are little things we can have fun. Again, the San Francisco one has four, you know, four and a half million. But look at the big S there. Is it centered? No, it's supposed to be centered between the wor words E in trade and D in dollar. Yeah, just punched right in there. But this one grades, that one grades MS65. Whoops. I get this right. Collectors like there, even in even in trade dollars, people like errors. And there are a couple of collector errors worthy of your consideration if you want to get into this. And they're not too expensive. You can find them. You can probably can find them in a dealer's lots because many of them don't look for this particular, these particular errors. So you can get them for maybe a couple, 300 bucks in lower grades. We're talking fine, very fine, extra fine. But they're, even in those lower grades, they're, they're very sharp and easy to see. Two major varieties, as I mentioned, trade dollars worth mention. First one is the 1875S over CC on the reverse die. And the second one is an 1876P reverse double die eagle. So we'll give you a chance to look at these. Again, this is the fun of the collecting. Come on, move. There you go. But here we have pictured is an 1875 S over CC trade dollar. Price today is around you know, $4,500. In 60, as I say, grading, if you can get one in good, you can see it probably in good too. You'll look at the purple arrow. You can see it in the small one. And then I've blown it up here to enlarge it so you can really see it. And notice again, the S is not centered over where it should have been, but it was there probably to hide the CC. But the purple arrows indicate as well as the black ones do. As you can see, the C and C. How is this mule possible? Your guess is as good as mine, but that's part of the fun and lore of our hobby. 1876 CC is a double eagle reverse. Now this one, again, I tried to blow up as best I can to give you an idea. And it's not just doubling. This, this, this is what is born out as a double eagle. Look at the reverse. You can see some of the doubling, especially here on the wing on the right here, the left underneath. And again, all below here, the wings here. Look at the arrow double. There's arrow doubling in here. It's hard to see even blowing it up, but it's there. But this is a circulated coin. Notice the bold CC. I notice the letters are separate. But you can see a lot more. So these are worthy of collection. This will cost you a little more to get in. Well, a short interview of trade dollar counterfeits. I certainly know that every collector needs to be aware of these today. But if you notice my statement here, and Anybody can say, well, I could be wrong. Well, it might be safe to say that for every one genuine silver U.S. trade dollar out there, there are hundreds of fakes, even possibly thousands of fakes. When the convention was here in Los Angeles, the a, a convention in 2009, there were many street peddlers that all had coins they wanted to sell to the public. They were out on the streets, and I had an opportunity to walk in and try to see what they had. And they had want to buy this most of the stuff was trade dollars and you look at them and you put it in your hand and you almost drop it it weighed so much a lot of lead in that one but there are so many fakes many of them are lead as they they're even cast counterfeits that are horrible 
All sorts of metals are used, so be wary. I would suggest only buying it from a dealer, preferably one that is a professional numismatist that has done it, has checked it. But if you want to make sure this is not the thing to do, but you got to find a marble top, you can drop that coin on it. And boy, I'll tell you, you either hear a ring like you would with a dime quarter or silver half, or you could try it with your fingernail to see if it was. I just chew my fingernails, so I don't can't use that method. But the fake coins do not. And of course, what do they make? They got it. They are heavier. You can feel them, and they have a definite thud when they hit any kind of hard surface. There's no ringtone whatsoever. But today we find out that there's counterfeiters overseas manufacturing these coins regularly and they're melting down silver coins of our same period so from the 1870s they're melting it down using that alloys to make and this is where you have to have specific gravity tests and composition tests so it's very difficult to make sure you do not have or buy a counterfeit but those coins are very tough to tech. I know both the, all the grading services have trouble with those too, but they can usually tell because a lot of them are from the same persons. But melting them down from the coins, it makes the right grainage. It makes everything else in alloys also to be correct. So as I mentioned earlier, I have a 1879S. This is an example, trade dollar. And it's I'm going to offer it for sale. I'm not here to actually sell, but... You know, I mentioned earlier, it sounds like a good deal. You went to one of those street vendors, as I mentioned, perhaps in Los Angeles in 2009 when the show was there. But it sounds like a great deal. Eh, not bad. If you look at the artwork on it, yeah. not the best. Of course, is it genuine? No. You take a look at Lady Liberty, especially. What's wrong with that? Well, the coin is a scarb, rare date, discolored. From an estate sale, asking price, 150 or best offer. Well, this is where your grading and this is where your counterfeit detection skills come in. But this one is obviously by looking at just the obverse counterfeit. Look at the leaves holding up. Look at the torch. Need to know your design, know what a genuine one looks like. That's the first mistake there. And of course, the weeds of grain behind it. There's hardly anything there. It looks like the rats might have got it. I don't know. Can't see her feet. But yet it looks like there's water or, or marks by the lower part of her feet. You don't see that. And her knee, well, her one knee is higher than the other and it's covered. But it's been well worn off. Design not right. Now we look at the back. What's wrong with this one? Major giveaway? You know, the eagle is wrong. Look, look at the design of the eagle. He sure lost a lot of chest feathers, hasn't he? <laughs> and look at the arrows. They completely look like they've stabbed that poor eagle, especially, especially on the right left side of the coin. I mean, there. And the grains of silver, 420, it's off. The San Francisco mint mark is off. Uh, where are the berries? Looks like the eagle's sitting on something in water, a piece of stick. Again, this is probably an obvious one. So I'm assuming none of you were interested in my selling one. But the answer, of course, is the S, 1879S. And why not? Well, none were ever made. But I've managed to find about two, only two so far in my years of searching. And both are from the same creator. This one here is a little bit more detailed on the reverse. That's why I took it up. Arrows are changed. So this is the second one. I might, couldn't find the other one to put in this particular program. But you can see it from the earlier one when I needed it. But the arrows do not go through the wings. Dead giveaway. And the claws are standing out in the air. Obvious. But it's nice to have fun. Well, I'll trade down the greeting, guide. Right? I'm not going to burden you or break you down because you're going to have time to look at this program later on if you have silver or trade dollars at home you want to grade. But remember, grading is subjective science, and we need to know the key wear points on each grade. And so I'm going to quickly move through this here, but we'll start with the lowest grade. And this is about easy, about the AG. Now that you look at the details, and you can see a well-worn one, spacing and so forth. It just 
to go through it, but you can look at this and compare later. Here's a good four trade dollar. Diagnosis is up above it. Banners and things I've tried to note. Even on these coins compared to the counterfeits, you can still see a great deal of toes. And here's a very good eight. So if you have them at home again, Take your time, come back to the program and visit it. I know there's a, oops, let's move on to Find 12. And this one was from a coin dealer here. I'm, I found it, I liked it, the way he did it, but I, there's a ding marks there. It's a very fine, that's probably one I mentioned earlier, 30 to 35, this is the 35. Take a look at the headdress. 40 to 45, I want to be able to see both of them side by side. These are from my holdings, 78 CC on the left. That's a 40. And you probably see the difference if you look at the face and nose, a little more detail in the 45. Breastplate's a little more detailed here. The wings, you can see a little bit more in the 45 versus the 40. So those are some of the high points, but that knee, is an important point to keep in mind. And I uh, put in here the 55 because there are 50 and 55. 96S here has been clean. It looks like a higher grade, maybe an uncertain, but it is not. It has been heavily cleaned and dipped all over. There's nothing in the surface, and that's a shame. You have to look at close with the magnifying glass. My notes are above still one of the notes it looks like. And on the right, we've got a 73 cc. It's an AU natural circulated. So it's just from the natural circulation. The wear points are all there. So you can see the high points on the coin. Then again, remember the strikes, especially at Carson City, were often weaker. As many coins, of course, these weren't issued at New Orleans, but New Orleans also has lower. There's an AU 58 trade dollar. Take a look at some of the detail in the head, breastplate, the arm now, especially on the right side is beginning to show knee, little bit of work on the reverse on the tip of the top bar part of the eagle, the outer wing feathers, the tips, and down here with the arrows, make sure those arrows, especially on the reverse show, and of course the designs. And then here's a great MS-60. One certified here on the left from, it's hard to find an MS-60. It's usually 61, 62. Same thing with the Morgan and, and Peace Dollars. You find a lot more of those. But the this one here is an awful MS-60 on the left, but it's a CC. I like the year. It's a bicentennial year, but dull scratches, many bag marks. And on the left, so 63 CC, all details, sharp luster. Starting to be a little bit toning. As I said, I don't even wash them off. And many of the coins in my holdings have it here. And there's a lot of oils. You know, it's the only stock tone and the top of Liberty at first, the stars, for some reason. Again, CC, notice the CC here is set centered properly. A couple of clean coins, you probably hear about them. Here's a couple of horror cases in my thing for you to be aware of too. Especially the one on the right. Somebody just mutilated this poor 75 cc with abrasions. I bet they used Brillo pads or something, but they just look what they did to this coin. Notice that I've got it because I want to see the cc separation, the mint marks. Notice how separate they are in the 75 cc. Those so are different types like that. But dull color, dull toning, misleading. You can see the wear here on them. But all the sharpness around the stars, you can usually indicate, you can tell that it has been cleaned, but the toning, someone might have artificially toned it. Bob Campbell would be the expert on that. But anyway, a few trade dollar issues were proof and we're running down on time. So I'm going to quickly go because I'm sure there might be a couple of questions. But here's a proof, beautiful toning. I don't own this coin. I wish I did. I love those. Her hands look like they're being greasy fingers. Okay, here's a beautiful trade. You love this one? 
the scratches are on the coin, but I love the toning. Every color, almost like in the rainbow, is in this one. Just a beautiful one. I borrow this example from, again, I mentioned Bob Campbell from All About Coins in Utah, another former past president. But this coin is just gorgeous color-wise. Okay, approved trade dollars were issued, as I mentioned. I'm going to go roughly through this so I can get down to the end and hit my one-hour time limit. PCTS, I love. Nice one here. And then I want to, oops. And we want to get to the proof trade dollars towards the end. On the right here is a is one of the 1884 proofs only. It was discovered. This is a beautiful coin. Only 10 of these were struck. Why were they struck? Well, there must have been some kind of collector demand for these. And the mint was still making dies for them here way after the 1878 period that canceled the regular strikes needed for the public. But look at the difference in the dates. 81, look at the locations, the size. So we know there were different dies. It looks like there was only one die made of this one. So this 84 is in the same order as the 1913 Liberty Nickel. But look at the difference in the, the size. And then, of course, the classic rarity of the trade dollars, of which only five were struck. On the right, you'll find a copy of the 1885 from the Eliasburg Collection proof. 66 specimens sold for what? 3.1 million. And that was 10 years ago, I believe, it was sold. Beautiful coin. Look into that. You can see it up here. This is, these are examples again from NGC's files. Almost looks like it's made out of copper, but it's not. And then, some of those of you that are artists, I'm going to end the program here. If there's any ladies there, I apologize for this. But the art for some hobbyists is in the eye of the beholder, or is it the redesigner? And we find that a lot of the trade dollars were made into what was called potty dollars. This is one in my collection here. From It's an AG3, but it's been enhanced here. Uh, notice the artwork, much like the Hobo Nichols. They did the same thing with this particular trade dollar, I guess. I wonder if the government would accept this as trade, and this is in 1887. Come on, here it is. And here are the two that I purchased way back in 2007 from, from Tom Hollenbeck Galleries in Colorado Springs, 125 bucks each. And I got a discount, I'm sure. You can see the one on the left here. Beautiful, sitting naked on a throne behind a wall. God, they did a lot of artwork in these. And then, of course, the one on the right, naked, throne, breasts, highlighted with the throne. Anyway, this is some of the fun part that you can add to any collection as well. Okay, and, you know, how do you make change for a half of a trade dollar? Well, this was done by a friend of mine. <laughs> I have many 1873s, but you simply cut it in two halves. And, well, that's about does it for our program here. I love to talk about it. I know this is not a hobby interest of a lot of people, but it is certainly ends my history story here with the trade dollar. And there are some credits here to Ken Percent, David Lawrence Galleries, a number of others here, as well as U.S. Mint Records and a, a Museum Holdings about it. So if you... Have any questions or want to ask me, you can put this particular slide in at the end because we're all about e-learning education and helping collectors enjoy the hobby more so and getting making it a lifetime fun hobby. So if you have something you'd like to contact me about, you'll find my information above it here at ostermackey at money.org. And remind you, we have our World's Fair of Money coming up this year in Pittsburgh. August 8th through 12th, World's Fair of Money. Here's an opportunity for you to go out and buy trade dollars if you want to start one. Thank you all. Will you um, stop sharing your screen and then we can go back to just us on the screen. And then there, there does appear to be some questions. So I wanted to get through those. I do want to say I, um, 
I have to run out. So Sam is actually going to come in and finish all the questions because you've got up to 10 now. And I know that that I'm not going to be able to get those before by one o'clock. I have to run out of the building. So um, <laughs> I'll well, let Sam answer them. <laughs> I know. So um, actually, I Sam is just locked up. So I'm going to just give give us a minute to switch out here. Okay. And then um, I'm going to let him take on the questions. Well, for those of you that are watching still, I thank you for watching this program i hope you learned a little bit it's hard to come to put like 30 years in one little program but just trying to share some fun and highlights for it really makes it interesting for myself and i'm sure a lot of you are hobbyists this is an area that's not widely collected so you certainly can use it sam walter how you doing buddy you dyed your beard you look older today right. <laughs> sorry you can answer you all too I'm going to leave now. You can answer all the questions, okay? <laughs> nice. Wonderful. All right. If I can't, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Huh? I wish I knew trade dollars as well as you did. I don't know that well. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a hobbyist. I'm learning still every day. Go ahead. All right. So it looks like uh, we had a question come in. It says, uh, how were the trade dollars distributed in China and Hong Kong? How were they distributed? Uh, right. Yeah, just as a... Yeah, how uh yeah, how were the trade dollars distributed in China? Okay. And the banks in China or the Far East area at that time or merchants would order they would need 20,000 let's say trade dollars for use in silver. So the mint would make so many and they would ship them out, but it probably took them 6 months to get from let's say Philadelphia or even San Francisco to the trade areas and they would go through a bank. There's no actual records tell that the mint just said they shipped them based on orders. Now we start finding it down toward the latter part, 60, 76, 77, we find there are larger quantities. The government was anticipating from what Mr. Brissett had tried to let me know at that time that they were going to expect more to be used in trade and commerce. But then they started getting things back about the, the, the uh, chop marks. So that sort of cut down again the issue needed. So gotcha. it doesn't really well, help. But I, well, speaking of chop marks, there's a, another question that came in asking, uh, how could a stamped chop mark affect the, the coin's silver content? Well, if they're going to add on to it, I'm looking at could it increase the silver content? I doubt that any merchant would be. But I was asked this question in Phoenix, too, and I don't have a specific answer for it. But it, it, it could. But could if, if you're stamping something into it, you know, it's also a small piece of silver. You know, a very minute part could fall off. And that sure. one my, my gem there with the probably 30,000 chop marks on it, I'm sure there's some silver missing. But most of them circulated, there are 10, 12, 15, 20 chop marks at the most. You don't yeah, see them. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and who knows, maybe you know, chop marks, uh, you know, if they're overlapping, maybe a little chunk, little pieces could have fallen out. So, yeah, it could have affected the weight. And, and, and they were done by merchants at Marks, even little sales booths out in the street when they have the little carts that go along. But they would just do it. But you, sure. you would think that if a guy, there's some that are three and four of the same chop mark. You think the guy would know it was okay the first time he chopped, yeah. but he probably didn't look at it again. The heck with it. I'm going to do it, take it in again. Yeah, he just really, really, you know, felt felt secure that it was, you know. I just want his chop mark on it. I don't know. He <laughs> <laughs> advertises business. But they, those are all bank marks, supposedly. Banker or bank marks. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, another question. Uh, did the silver for the 1876 S trade dollar also come from the Comstock load as the CC issue did? Well, a lot of this Comstock silver was shipped to San Francisco, we know, because it was a huge mining exploit. So what is basically thought as knowledge that not the many, much of the silver did come from excess from Comstock, because that was a much larger mint, as you know, you've seen pictures of it even in the, at the time, the huge mint that it was. In Carson City, it was just a small, like a little garage type of operation, and they only had one press. So they would need a lot more silver for the other minor coins in circulation. So that is the assumption that we base. Okay. Much, and probably it could have been also from prospecting silver and gold in California as well. There'd been no other reason for it. All right. Well, thanks. So we've got another question. Uh, it says, uh, do you take them out of slabs? Uh, and then they say, I have an 1878 in an MS64 in a slab. 
Uh, I know if I had a 78 and a 64 holder, I'd probably leave it in that holder, yeah. but that's just I, me. Sam, I would do, I was going to say the same thing. Thank you for taking up my, I feel good. Now you're part of the program. Hey, welcome, <laughs> aboard. welcome to my world. No, I would leave it slapped because it could come out now. Grading could have changed. Who knows? I mean, if there was something wrong and there was, you know, it was turning black or was a carbon, then I might take it out. But yeah, I have to start getting it problematic that, that yeah, way. Because if that nitrogen in there, that air starts affecting that silver, it doesn't usually. But sometimes yeah. there could be dirt or something on it. You never know. But if it's slapped, I suggest, unless you want it, and try to resubmit it for a different grade. I don't know the purpose for cracking. Yeah, I'm not it. sure. I, well, I guess maybe it depends on what service. Maybe someone's, if you're trying to cross it uh, to a, if you think it's going to go into a higher grade holder, but man, that's always a crap shoot. I don't yeah, know. But see, and now too, you know, supposedly that that coin is genuine. That's already been slapped. You right. Take it exactly. out, and somebody else could say, well, that's a counterfeit. So you'd have to go through a process there. Just something to think about for the collector. And I'm glad you brought up counterfeits because it leads us to our next question. And I think I know the answer to this one because I've well, seen Go ahead. It. Go ahead. Take a stab at it. Are there counterfeits with trade with chop marks? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> yes, Many are. of them. <laughs> yes, there, are. there are counterfeits with trademarks. And then there are also counterfeit chop marks chop as marks. well. Shoot. I got to add a counterfeit trade dollar with chop marks. Uh, see, that's something now when I hear questions, I can add something to enhance the program. Oh, I our students are the best teachers. See, these, these people, uh, there was what, there's 68 or 80 people out there. I'm nice. glad to with that. Absolutely. There, that, there's counterfeits. Heck, there's you, you can make it in the sandbox. I played around with one in my backyard with aluminum. <laughs> wow. Made the cast <laughs> thing into the sand and put a you know, melted aluminum down and poured it in. It looked crappy. I should have brought that up too, but that we don't have time for an hour program. <laughs> but yes, sure. yes. So another question. Okay, are there any books you'd write any other books you'd recommend to learn more about trade dollars? There's nothing specifically on it. You have to go back and look at Mint Records. R.W. Julian, the great author, the great researcher, he's done a lot of articles. I believe he did one. I don't have it on my a number of years back on the trade dollar itself. A little bit more about the history. So that's the best. There's nothing specifically been written about trade dollars. There are a couple of small pamphlets, but they're just basically oh, the date. This is the mint mark. This is the grading system. There's nothing in detailed history. And sure. like I say, the program, they say, you know, starts in 1873. That's why I went back to 1869 with my research to cover when all this took place. Because it's, it, looking at 1830s and the law needed to be changed. So there's nothing specific that which there was. Hmm. I uh next question. So the rumored made in China trade dollar <laughs> that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Yes, yes, time, yes. Are they contemporary or modern counterfeits, or were only the dyes made in China? Well, remember, those were probably done at the time. Now remember, those are patterns. Okay, so people could do that even nowadays. If they have that dye, that person could still have that pattern and sell it. The person or whatever that's doing it could pawn it off. But it was it was assumed that it was done back then. That's why it was assumed that it was assumed that it was done in China. And it could have been. There's vendors there that make counterfeits nowadays for all sorts of things. I was there a number of years ago in Beijing, and I'm looking at a couple of stands and coins. I said, do you have a certain so-and-so? Come back in an hour. I have it for you. So that, was, <laughs> that led me to believe, well... You might have something, but it's good to have a counterfeit. So that doesn't give you the answer you're looking for. Okay. But uh, um, uh, interesting question. What do you usually look for in toning in the MS issues? For me, I like the multicolored, but my collection is a lot of, I like the golden patina, the gold color for toning. Okay. And that's certainly the, the one I showed with the blues, the greens, the oranges, and the reds. I see. And then okay. again, usually I'll show the those. Green's the color of money, right? <laughs> well, I'll, I will also show them to Bob Campbell, who's the expert on toning, artificial yeah. toning, too. He's an a and &E member and a past president, as I mentioned in the program earlier. And but I think he was a he, chemistry major, well, too. I see him at a lot of shows that I do kids' people. programs at. I said, Bob, I just got this trade dollar. What do you think of that toning? Oh, let me tell you this. And he'll tell you about how it started. Somebody shellacked it and did something to it if it's artificially done. 
Right. But the one, yeah, so, I love talking to Bob about toning issues. And, and Bob's done a number of books on it. He has a summer seminar program on toning. So is Bob Campbell. He's all about coins in Utah, Salt, Salt Lake City. Yeah. Nice. Well, that's too general a question. What tips would you give me to grow in knowledge about coins? We're going to have to skip that. Um, so, computer, uh, computer, Google, yeah, exactly. find out. <laughs> Google. Watch out for Wikipedia. There's a lot of errors, probably. Yeah, minutes, careful. <laughs> but at least you can do it. But you can also begin to visit Mint Records, a lot of them. R.W. Julian has done great research on them. And when, uh, what's his name? Forget the gentleman name right now. You know, with the shorts, pants, beard, white beard. We have a, another question that actually came in about Mint Records. Uh, are there no Mint Records for the 1884 and um, for the 1884 proof? But no records for the 1885, not quite a. Well, there's no records for anything, but we didn't know about them. They didn't even know that they existed. But if you look at the two dies, that's why I put the two of them side by side. They're different dies. And that's why I put the 81 in there, another different die. So remember, those were done at Philadelphia. For the one, for whatever reason, the 81, the person, the uh, mint superintendent at that time included it, but it's supposedly included in the total mintage. Because if you take off the, what was it, 900 and somewhat that they they suspect was done, the figures add up. So he has it listed. So mint records are not available to the public, but the, they do post a lot of information like that online at the Treasury Department. And you can contact some of the research departments at the various mints, Philadelphia or San Francisco, and well, you won't be able to use Carson City, but they have histor historians that can go back and research for you. You pay a little bit for it, but they help you research something if you want to know specifics. That's why, because I tried to research and find out where's the an 86 and 87, because yeah. it wasn't discontinued till February 87. So the dot they had to have dies made. Huh. And why was uh, production discontinued? Well, basically, it was probably collector demand was falling off, and then the government was phasing out that particular coin anyway, most likely. Remember, it's not U.S. coins, not circulating. So it was basically the few collectors that were around at the time bought those coins. Not, you know, like so, Mr. Green did with the, the 13 Liberty. It was a die there. So he says, I want those, you know, 13 Liberties. And he got them. But so uh, this is a bit more vague, and I hope it's in reference to just trade dollars. Uh, I know the person asking the question. Uh, how would you start a collection, I guess, of trade dollars? Uh, Nowadays, you're going to pay a lot more. They're probably, you know, as, as I mentioned, for $100, $150 to $200 just for a good condition one. Yeah, I think I got my uh, first one. The only one I ever had was in uh, VF. Uh, I got it, I think, at a store in Canoga Park when I was on vacation as a kid in California. And uh, I think I uh, wound up paying about 75 or 80 bucks for it. Yeah, they, they were back, <laughs> the back then in the 80s. They were about that particular price but those potty dollars that i showed too tom hollenbeck now sells those for the 500 dollars range the potty dollar really wow uh, yeah well, i bought my two there that were in those two by twos i left them in that 125 nice. a piece but that was but then again you, 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 the thing is go to you'll find a lot of them a lot of dealers won't don't do them or they they may even have in what they call a a, a cherry picker's box behind See, yeah, hey, junk box. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I'll call it cherry pickers. I'll stick with Bill Fever on that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to call it a cherry pickers box because then it might tip a dealer off. You know, so I couldn't do that. Well, if you cherry pick it, move. you know the dot price is going to go up. And that's exactly. Yeah, if I, if I so the, the cherry, box, the word cherry picking. He knows the price is going to be five bucks or whatever. Cherry picking it. Well, but you're looking for some. Just, I want some unique. You might find some errors. There's all sorts of things that are possible. Exactly. But it, to me, I just like to but bring along your loop and make sure you got good lighting. Because oh, a lot of the sure. circulated ones are well-worn. There's a lot of dirt on them. They're just colored. But just have fun. But the knowledge you pick up, knowledge is the key. So the knowledge that you learn about them. And again, a Red Book is a good place to start or program such as this on any coin. But again, I'm not the expert on it. I'm just one that enjoys this particular odd area. So there's a question here, but uh, it says, uh, why didn't China just make their own? But if I remember, I thought they had something that was similar to uh, trade dollars, at least where would they Japan did in Great Britain. Where would they get the amount of silver they need? Okay, and, and, and to piggyback on that point, take a look at China. Let's say uh, 
1960s, 1970s, when they were beginning to mainland, when they were beginning to emerge. Okay. What were they buying? What were they in India buying? Silver. Anywhere they could get it for what? Well, bullion. So they didn't, it looks like they didn't have silver there to do in trade. So they use a barter system there too. But a lot of the stuff, Mexico found a way, France was in there involved too, and even Spain somewhat, to, have, to ship their coins over. So they could have melted those coins down and made their own, but they didn't have it, their own coinage. You know, they had little local, this tribe, that tribe, where there, there's so many different clans, so many little different, like you call them little duchies everywhere, yeah. so out through the districts. But there was, they just didn't have the silver. And they were still were importing silver. And the U.S. figured, well, we can make some money off this by having it. And that's probably one of the reasons that Congress in 1837 decided to go with it. Okay. Uh, there's a couple people who uh, answered the question about other uh, books that are out there. And of course, uh, I think there's a red book, um, how red book has broken into certain series of uh, no. coinage. Now, I think there is one uh, by uh, QDB, by uh, Q. David Bowers, uh, called Silver Dollars and Trade Dollars of the United okay. States. So yeah, if there, that may be uh, one of the only uh, print uh, resources uh, that I'm uh, aware yeah, of. Um, stuff thank you for uh, people who uh, responded to yeah, that. Thank you, folks. I, that helps me. I think David Bowers probably be out of print, but he did a great amount of research too on all sorts of coins. I don't know sure. if it's out of print, but I'm not sure if it's a newer, uh, how Whitman uh, has uh, the series now on a lot, uh, on a, on a lot of uh, the, the smaller red books that go in depth on uh, certain uh, types of uh, U S coins. So there's, yeah, there uh, could be one on, uh, on trade dollars. I, I'd have to double check, but I wouldn't doubt it. I know uh, you probably Google a lot of probably Google online. Again, I didn't have, I guess I don't go through most of that. I, Got my stacks of, you know, all my stuff is here, written and oh, yeah. taken off and built, put together. So yeah, that real research. That's the way it's done, kids. Do. Pay attention. <laughs> so, um, question also about uh, resources, and I think I know the answer to this one. Uh, someone wanted to know: Is there any guide to chop marks and understanding the merchant that made a chop marks? Is there a way to know what fake chop marks are? The my only guess would be yeah. a. To check the Brunk book? No, nope, there's, a, there's a small pamphlet put out, and I have it somewhere in my oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, uh, there may also be something in Brunk. It, it, it's chop uh, marks. It just talks sure. in general about chop marks, tells you how to identify which banks they came from or bankers they were used at. But it's a small pamphlet, probably what, seven by nine or, or something of that nature, a small pamphlet. I, that's not my, I can't, I'm looking across the room. I, show, I know it's up there somewhere. But there is one, but it was done many years ago, I think probably in the 60s or 70s. But it would it just dealt specifically with chop marks. The the bankers, the who, who, what bank was it? This bank, what it was, which banker held it to show you which merchant had it. They wasn't very detailed, but again, we're talking something, maybe a dozen pages, if I recall correctly. But there is a pamphlet out there about chop marks. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions that we'll answer here, folks. Uh, so one person wanted to know, uh, what do you think about collecting by mint? Uh, I'm collecting S mint marks by year, for example. Hmm. Would they, would they like my 1879 S? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it, so I'm not sure. And they're they're counterfeits. None were ever made. Yeah, I was going to say, I know that doesn't sound for Morgan. Dollar, I don't remember? <laughs> I don't. But yeah, I, I, no, so but one last question then. Well, um, so many slabbed trade dollars that I see for sale have been cleaned. Why? Don't know. If, yeah. <laughs> if, probably, if you probably look at some of the ones I showed in my collection, when we went through the grading ones. Notice how dirty and worn they are. They 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 well circuit. They must have been well used, whether it was over in the Far East or Asia, or even here for a while. But I wonder if the government, when they had the uh, Silver coming from the Pittman Act. It was 1917, if I'm not is that correct? Uh, I think it was 18, but 18, yeah, okay, I'm close. Yeah. My brain is out to lunch probably by now. <laughs> when they took all that silver, and I wonder if a lot of those were not trade dollars that were still in government vaults. Remember, they were here. Now, the government would not accept or trade anyone that was chop marked, but anything that was turned in, and it got the dollar value. But that was from the Pittman Act. I know they, they went... And used a lot of silver and melted a lot. That's why a lot of the 70s the CCs 
Yeah. And of course, people, uh, you know, you see clean coins. Everyone wants to, uh, you but know, you really wanna, just. Uh, well, doesn't a doesn't bright, shiny coin, you know, get your blood flowing, get your anxiety going? Oh, it looks great. It's clean. Like a new mint coin from 2023, I get in change. I got to look at it. You know, it's bright, shiny. And so exactly. that gets your interest. And you say, well, you clean it, polish it up, put a lot of Brillo on it, you know, do some Ajax, jeweler luster. Oh, you can really load it up, you know. <laughs> the coin looks great for a while. Then all of a sudden, down it goes. But sure. people like a bright, shiny coin. Oh, but yeah. we, strive. we strive for the uncirculated ones, you know, the proofs especially because they have a much higher surface, a brighter color. Yep. So that it's it's just a personal liking, but I assume that was the way they sell them. The ones that I saw in 2009 at the convention in Los Angeles, they were all really shiny. They must have had a buffer in the back. <laughs> They're so really whizzing. whizzing. <laughs> They're really whizzing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, just that we're not making fun of anybody, but this is part of the fun of of the hobby as a Oh whole. heck yeah! All right, folks. Well. Thank you so much for joining us today. And to you, Walt, thank you so much for your time and for a great presentation. Uh, Just uh, to let you all know, we won't have any presentations in June due to our annual summer seminar that's going on here toward uh, the last couple of weeks of June. So please be sure to check for future programs on our website at money.org under the events tab and new MISMA talks. And with that, Bid everyone a great day and uh, enjoy your hobby. Enjoy our hobby. Our hobby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, and everyone else, thank you very much. Okay. Have thank a great day, everybody. Listening. You have my address. It's on the end of it there. So if anybody has questions, I'll try and answer them or help you as best I can. So I did provide that to the individuals. Thank you, Sam. Sounds great, Dr. Ostromecki. Thanks again All for right, your we'll time, sir. You All right. Bye now.